Well, guys, I want to welcome you to Overtime, which is taking Sunday's conversation further and deeper. And we are right in the middle of a series called Brick by Brick, where we are talking about leadership. And uh, the cool thing is we can all grow in our leadership and uh, we can grow in our influence, which ultimately what we're talking about in Proverbs 28 can lead to strength, can lead to endurance, and ultimately help us lead to something better in life. And I think that's what we desire. And so today, I'm really excited that uh, to introduce you to an uh, uh, individual who is one heck of a leader from everything I have heard, everything I have read, and uh, just my short experience getting to know him. And so I'm excited to introduce you to Tim Kennedy. Hey. So, Tim, hey. welcome, man. Thanks for having me. Yeah. Well, man, I'm so excited you're here. I mean, I've, I've read a lot about you. I've, you know, heard you on several podcasts and you and I, you know, just getting to know each other. It's been fun. It has been, yeah. So, you know, and your life is, good Lord. I mean, it's an adventure. Yeah. It's like Benjamin Button um, <laughs> on some really, really bad drugs. <laughs> yeah. no, this, 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 I, I didn't life. think of it that way, but now I am. <laughs> so <laughs> that's awesome. So, hey, thanks for being here. Yeah. And, you know, I'm, I'm excited just to get some insight and kind of learn the things you've learned in terms of leadership. And hopefully it's going to be beneficial for all of us. Yeah. And that's the best thing about stories is um, you get to learn from other people's mistakes. Mm -hmm. And as you have realized in the short conversation that we've had leading up to this is there's lots of mistakes. <laughs> so at no point, I think, could somebody, you know, if you went to my first team sergeant, when I showed up to my first Special Forces ODA, mm -hmm. and you're like, John, what do you think of Tim? And John's like, I want to skin, skin him alive so I can wear his, his skin as a birthday suit. Because that's yeah. the best use of Tim right now because he's completely useless. Wow. That's fairly ferocious. <laughs> yeah. yeah. But I'm, I'm not joking. I'd be probably said those words wow. numerous times. Yeah. So, but then like failure after failure after failure after mm -hmm. failure after failure, eventually if you're, and I'm dumb where it takes enough failure to finally turn that that ship away from the iceberg, yeah. which were all of the bad life decisions, um, you, you something starts to take shape, mm -hmm. and that shape is hopefully leadership. <laughs> <laughs> well, there you go. That's yeah. quite an introduction yeah. right there. A lot of living. Well, man, I'm grateful. I'm grateful for you being here. And I know, uh, you know, I've learned a little bit about you, but I'd love, you know, if there's anything else that you would, you know, share about, you know, life, about relationships, like who are you a little bit? Yeah, so... Um, I, I father that was talented and kind of famous in in counter drug in the mm -hmm. the the peak of war on drugs when Reagan's like we're gonna fight these guys and yeah. you know stop these guys from selling drugs you know Pablo Escobar is is running drugs every which way my, my dad was one that would steal a plane full of cocaine in Costa Rica from Pablo fly it back to the United States distribute it to all of the the regional distributors and then arrest them all in like one go that's unbelievable because um, we couldn't get Pablo so might as well get all the people that were distributing it. yeah um, he'd sit there and you know he's brilliant mind he'd look at guys cooking meth in a trailer and and then go and cook meth. That's my dad as a narcotics officer. He'd go and cook meth and then figure out how they did it and how they sourced all their materials. Okay, if I needed to get this, mm -hmm. these materials, I would have to buy so much of all of these different ingredients. Mm. So then all the laws that we know about limiting um, how much NyQuil you can buy, like those were laws that were created because of my dad. Um, so that was me as a kid. That's unbelievable. And how, I mean, like all this has taken place and how old are you? I'm like, six to 15. Wow. Yeah. And then at 15, um, I'm out of high school, become a firefighter EMT at 18 and then go to the police Academy at 21. I'm in grad school at this time. And then at 22, nine 11 happens and I enlisted mm -hmm. on nine 11. Wow. And then that was, uh, me going into special forces, which I've been doing for the past 17 years while I was fighting professionally for the UFC. Right. Well, UFC fighting. Yeah, that's that, you know, I was sharing with you, like, I'm a, I'm a UFC fan. So yeah. it's so cool, like to be here and and uh, to be with you because UFC was not part of my life growing up or, you know, I was definitely not a fighter and all that yeah. good stuff. But like 10 years ago, a buddy of mine invited me into, you know, to watch a UFC fight. And I was like, what? what is this? He's like UFC. And I was like, those are the people like kill each other in the cage like that thing, like yep. pay-per-view, like kind of weird cartoon thing. And he was like, yeah, you got to come see it. And I'm telling you, my first UFC fight, like I had that, like just the adrenaline spike. I was like, this is 
awesome. It's crazy. And ever since, I've been hooked. And, yep. you know, I have watched you a couple times, you know, in the ring and had no idea one day I'd sit here and hang out with you. And yeah. So, like, tell me about, like, where's what's where's UFC in your life right now? Like, are you engaged in it, watching it? Yeah, I'm still engaged in it. I still train as if I'm fighting. Mm -hmm. um, so I still, you know, train 12 times a week, you know, from wrestling to jujitsu, boxing, uh, conditioning. But um, I still travel to Albuquerque to do fight camps, mm. um, still bring in, actually Austin is became, becoming a Mecca for grappling. So is it really? Yeah. We, huh. we have some of the best grapplers on the planet that now live in Austin. Yeah. Um, those are good friends of mine. So I get to train with, with the best in the world here in my home city instead of traveling all over, all over the place. That's um, convenient. Yeah. That's cool. Which is pretty awesome. But, uh, yeah. UFC was always just a means to an end, mm -hmm. you know, like in, in college when I was trying to figure out how to pay for school and, you know, Chuck Liddell is, is a friend of mine from college age and John Hackleman and Scott Adams, the early owners of the, U, of the WC, like, mm -hmm. you know, if you fight this weekend, you know, we'll give you 500 bucks. And I was like, $500. I mean, I'm going to be fighting this weekend anyways. Yeah. You know, like this is awesome. And how old were you when that uh, was happening? Like 19. Goodness. Yeah. yeah. 500 bucks is a lot of money back. Yeah. Then. Yeah. Especially for a fight that I would, would probably have been in anyways. Yeah. You know, um, I mean, I <laughs> was driving well down paid for it. <laughs> exactly. <laughs> Tijuana, you know, I could, I could make a thousand bucks there, go to the, in California, we have all these Indian reservations up and down, um, the whole entire state. And in one weekend I could do a fight on like a Friday night. Um, and then another one on a Saturday night at a different India casino. So in one weekend I could fight at two different Indian casinos, you know, sometimes bare knuckle. This is the, before the yeah. UFC is what it is today, where it's it's sanctioned by athletic commissions and there's weight classes. Then I remember fighting a dude that was 300 pounds. You know, this is Samoan, bare knuckle. Yeah. And, um, you know, going down to Tijuana and you know, like, we weren't like dipping our hands in glue and then dipping them into glass, you know, but like darn near. Yeah. It was pretty crazy. That is nutty. And, and yeah, how do you do that? Like back-to-back -back fights? I mean, I've watched some of those and those guys get annihilated. Yeah, I mean... Fortunately, in the early days, there was such disparity between the athletes. Now, yeah. when you look at, you know, Kelvin Gesslum is, is is fighting for, you know, Yoel Romero. Yoel Romero is fighting somebody else for a title. You know, those guys are like, ounces matter, mm -hmm. you know, and, and milliseconds and timing matter. Like yeah. back in the dark days where I'm fighting in a roped off ring with cardboard as as the bottom in, mm -hmm. in a... In, in the basement of a bar in New Orleans, yeah, uh, which, which literally I did numerous times. That's so nutty. There was quite the disparity. Feels like a movie. Yeah, yeah. Feels like you're like you know yeah. you're describing some movie that we're watching together, yeah. and I'm like, man, that's nutty. Yeah. So that's how it began. Mm -hmm. And then what happened? How'd you go get in the UFC? Uh, I was actually forced into yeah. the UFC. So I, I fought for the WC, and the WC was bought by the UFC, and I, I fortunately was able to get out. So then I went to the IFL, and I was fighting for the IFL, and I was undefeated in the IFL, um, and then the UFC bought the IFL. So then mm -hmm. I got out of the IFL. And then I went to Strike Force, and I was fighting in Strike Force, um, you know, beat Robbie Lawler and Melvin Manhoff, um, wow. like big, big, most yeah. famous names at the time. Yeah. And then the UFC bought strike force but they also bought the roster like they mm. bought the stable so even though my contract was with strike force i couldn't get out yeah so it, it was like if this you know a baseball team i don't know baseball <laughs> but let's say like the dodgers bought the what's another baseball team name yeah rangers the rangers okay Boom. They bought the the rangers um they not only got the all the elements from the content and um the marketing and all of the apparel, but they also got all of the players. Wow. Okay. So they, they did it right that time. Yeah. And I stuck. Yeah. So they, they didn't like me because I had been very outspoken about Dana White in the UFC. You were outspoken? Yeah. <laughs> Imagine <laughs> That's that. That's just crazy. <laughs> so they, they tried to pair me in my first few fights with the people that they thought I would lose to. Mm -hmm. And uh, then they just realized I didn't care and I was going to beat up anybody they put in front of me. And uh, that was... So, wow. Yeah. That's, that's crazy. Yeah. First fight against Hodger Gracie. 
So he was the number one grappler on the planet. Yeah. At the time, Dana was like, I don't want to see this grappling stuff. Tim just takes these guys to the ground and beats them. Well, I only took right. guys to the ground that I couldn't knock out on the feet. Yeah. You know, it's like Melvin Manhoff. He's a better striker than I am. He was one of the best kickboxers ever. Yeah. So I was like, I don't want to stand here against this guy. So I'll just put him on his back and just, you know, rough him up a little bit. And why not? Yeah. Yeah. So like, all right, well, why don't you f- grapple? Try to beat the best grappler on the planet. And right. I was like, okay. That's crazy. I'll just do that. So when you, I mean, when you get in the cage with this guy, like, are you nervous? Are you thinking like, oh my gosh, like this is a Gracie right there? Yeah. I mean, so by then I had already been blown up in Afghanistan, yeah. you know, gunfights up and down um, the country, Iraq, going and finding the number one bad guy in the planet mm-hmm. in Iraq, um, Zarqawi. So at, at this point, mm-hmm. um, I still got the good jitters, you know, like where, yeah. you, where you're walking out. Keeps you focused. Yeah. And yeah. the crowd's going crazy and the camera's in your face and you see the octagon in front of you, you know, and, and Stitch comes up and he starts putting Vaseline on your eyes, you know, and you're looking across the octagon at what your opponent will be and the cage door closes and tonk. And they, they drop the, they have like this big metal pin that they yeah. push through it. Because in the early days, we used to fall through the cage door all the time. That's crazy. Yeah, because they put like little carabiners. Yeah. And then they forget that like, a 220 pound troll is going to fall through sure. when he's fighting another 220 pound troll. Wow. Um, and then you hear that conk with the cage being closed and, yeah. you know, John McCarthy standing there and you're looking across the ring. At, and so at that moment, of course, you have that like, yeah. Yeah. That's, do that this. feels so like, you know, this Sunday I was talking about like Braveheart, you yeah. know, the movie William Wallace and, you know, the whole thing. And like, that's a gladiator kind of moment. That's a Braveheart moment. Yeah. Well, I, I've never had like a gigantic battle axe or, you know, the Highlander sword. Right. And I'm looking across at a bunch of thousands of horses that are about to run me down. So while I think I have some pretty extraordinary sure. experiences... <laughs> I, That's I, different. I don't, yeah, I don't know if I have, if, I was, if William Wallace is like, you know, yeah. follow me. I'm like, I don't know. This looks like a really bad yeah. plan. I don't want to see my own low probability here entrails all mm-hmm. over the ground here. Yeah, but you got to paint your face blue if you did it. I definitely do that. Yeah, no that doubt. seems cool. Yeah. <laughs> Well, man, I, I, I love UFC. I think it's, it's uh, you know, we have, like, you know, I'll invite our staff over and be like, hey, let's watch this UFC. I watched the uh, Khabib, or I didn't, I just watched it on, like, Fight Tracker because it yeah. was in the middle of the day. Yeah, and crazy. I had no idea, but, yeah, I mean, that was He is some special kind of athlete. Yeah, yeah. I, I, I have no idea. Like, nobody can beat him. No. Yeah, so. Nobody can score a point on him. That's like, nutty. I don't know if he's lost a round. Yeah. That's, I mean, and that's against the best in the world. Yeah. Yeah, there's nobody better. Yeah, his last six fights have been like former champion, interim champion, former champion, interim champion, former champion. Yeah. And like... Do you think he's going to stay retired? <clears throat> um, so while I really love him as an athlete yeah. and as a person too, like he's... Yeah, he seems remarkable. Um, he, he He's also very radicalized. Yeah. Um, and that's mm. that's a really slippery slope because his, his passion right now right. isn't fighting. His passion, especially with the recent passing of his father... Yeah is um, along the kind of fanatic path. Yeah. And I, I'm, mm. I'm hoping that yeah. he has friends that will keep, because he's such a such a talented person mm-hmm. and such a leader. Yeah. He really is. People will follow that guy. He's got a lot of influence right now. Yeah. 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 Good and bad. Hopefully it goes the good way. Yeah, absolutely. Yeah. Wow. Well, thanks for entertaining. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. Jumping in the UFC, Covered man. Covered in my own blood and mostly naked. <laughs> So my fights were. That's one way to look at it for sure. Yeah. yeah, awesome. Well, I'd love to talk about you know talk to you about UFC a bunch, um, but we're actually here to talk about leadership, yeah. which there's lots of good leadership mm-hmm. stuff in UFC. But I'm just curious for you, like just like your earliest memories when like you know you begin to connect the dots, kind of the cognitive abilities came together, and you were like, I think that's leadership. Yeah. Like, do you remember like the first time you connected the dots for leadership and said, man, that's that's something there. Yeah, um, I have two two real clear stories. One, I'm an 18 year old firefighter Mm -hmm. and, um, we have this church van that rolled over on one oh one at three o'clock in the morning and firefighting is a real weird thing. You know, you're asleep in your bed and you're beep, beep, 
beep, a task mm. or a fire, mm-hmm. vehicle collision on 101 southbound between mile markers, you know, and, and like you're not quite conscious yet, mm. you know, like your brain's not working, um, but you're already processing information. Mm-hmm. And then lights are, aren't really on, but sirens are kind of on. So it's like you're living in a dream, mm-hmm. you know, and, and sensory overload because there's lots of audible things from the sirens to your boss, my captain, Agassin, telling me what to do. Um, Tom Way, who is the senior paramedic at the time, you know, like I'm, I'm an 18, I'm a baby. Yeah. Like I'm, I'm frontal lobe is not developed. Right. And, um, you know, I was probably doing some pretty irresponsible things right before my shift. Mm. So here, here we are driving down and we pull up to where the vehicle had rolled over and it was only about two miles South of where the station was Mm. and the dust was still settling. It was really dry and, um, which created this horrific nightmare, like visual because Mm. the dust through the headlights and the, and the rotating red, um, lights from the fire truck were bouncing off all of the dust particles that were kind of settling. Mm-hmm. And it was so eerie. And I get out and I can hear moaning. And there's a couple of people that are walking around, but you know, they're, they're physically injured mm. very, very bad. And, uh, you know, arms in weird positions. So it looked, again, nightmarish. Mm-hmm. And I'm, I'm hearing, you know, there's a cry that a kid that is in so much pain um, only that kid in that kind of pain can make those sounds and, right. and you know, you never want to, I can't recreate them and thank God. Mm-hmm. Um, so we start trying to triage. We don't know what's happening and I don't know how we didn't run over people coming in because mm-hmm. they were just strolling across the highway. Wow. Um, 12 of them, mm-hmm. mostly women and children. And it was a church van that was coming back from a missions trip in, um, Southern California. And, um, I start working on this, this little girl and, uh, she was five or six years old and um, Tom Way, you know, he's triaging. He's, he's like walking wounded, go to the, to the van, mm-hmm. like picking up and moving people out of the, the high grass so that we could figure out how bad their injuries were. At the time, you used DCAP BTLS, like deformities, contusions, abrasions, punctures, penetrations. You'd, you'd like do this once over and figure out how right. bad they were. Yeah. And then you'd triage them accordingly. And I'm, I'm like tunnel vision on this little girl. Gosh. And I'm like, I, I'm doing CPR. I, th- I think... I'm doing the right thing. And Tom comes up and he puts his hand on my shoulder. And he's like, hey, Tim, go search over in this area and see if there's anybody over there. Mm-hmm. And I'm going to take care of this one. And at the time... Um, and you're 18. I'm 18, yeah. Wow. Um, one, I think this... I, I just found out this year that girl lived. Mm. For the past 20 years, I have been under the impression that the girl had died. Mm. And Tom came in to move me from a pointless endeavor of me trying to save somebody that's going to die. But he really just came in to tap me out. Mm -hmm. Like, Hey, you're, you're, you are better used as an 18 year old idiot EMT. Go walk through the grass and see if you can find somebody else. Yeah. Let me as the most senior paramedic here, try and save this. But he was so gentle about it. He was so caring and compassionate and understanding, knowing that I'm like, yeah, I'm at sensory complete overload. There's no more things I can process. So that gentle touch with that fatherly voice, Tim, giving me a task, task condition standard, task, go out here and look for these things, conditions. It's super rough out there, but I know you can do it. Standard. Anybody you find, go move them over here. Yeah. You know, so clear. And that was Mm -hmm. the first like occupational example of leadership Mm -hmm. where that gentle loving hand was able to save me from real pain Mm. and actually do good. Mm -hmm. Just a couple of years before that, I'm 16 years old and my family has this beach house in Cambria, California. And um, my uncles who are heroes in, in the most remarkable way, Vietnam kicks off. One of them gets drafted. The other one's in college. And the one that gets drafted has a baby on the way. Mm. The one that's in college is kind of protected. So he goes to the recruiter's office and he says, you send my brother to Germany, I'll enlist in infantry and um, send me wherever you want. Mm. And like, we'll get two for one. This sounds like a great deal. Wow. Done. So one brother goes to Germany. The other brother goes into the heart of Vietnam and just pain, suffering, you know, awards for valor. Um, but example of leadership. And I use that as the segue as to now I'm 16 same two uncles are at our beach house in California and they would come in. They're both incredibly successful men. Um, you know, one's an attorney and very affluent, you know, so he would bring Mm -hmm. these bottles of wine and we'd all come together and would make our, our family out, um, tacos and would drink these really 
I mean, you know, hundred, hundred tacos of, and wine. Yeah. Tacos and wine. Mm-hmm. And this I'm driving there for the first time. And so I think I'm an adult, you know? Mm-hmm. So I go and I pick up a bottle of turning leaf Merlot. <laughs> yeah. There you go. And I show up and I think I'm so like grown up. I drove to the beach house. Mm-hmm. You know, my uncles are there and I bring them a bottle. I'm bringing a bottle of wine. Cause that's what, you know, that's what they all did. You know, I'm like, mm-hmm. I'm so awesome. And I put the turning leaf down and he has like, you know, this bottle's a few hundred dollars. Right. I don't know this. And, and, and I'm like, would, you know, can I pour you a glass? And he's like, I would love some. So I pour him a glass of my turning leaf. He's like, really appreciate you bringing this. I'm like, it's my pleasure. You like, yeah. <laughs> not a big deal. <laughs> you know, and my cousin comes up and she's like, oh, that is the grossest wine ever. You know, <laughs> my dad, do you know what that is? I was like, yeah. no, I don't know what that is. You know, no. I'm 16. Yeah. And um, she's like, man, 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 it's my cousins, right? So we're doing the cousin sure. thing. And she's yeah. like, well, that, that bottle's like a few hundred dollars. And I was like, what? So I go, Uncle John, one, why are you drinking that bottle here? Yeah. Why on today? Like, why not on like New Year's Eve or Christmas? You know, mm-hmm. it's like, well, in that moment, I can't enjoy it, right? Because like Pulp Fiction, sensationalized, everything is going to be lost in, in the event. Mm. Like we're, we're with our family, having mm-hmm. our family tacos, watching the sunset on the Pacific Ocean from mm. Cambria. And I'm surrounded by my sister and my brother and my kids and my nieces and my nephews. Can you mm-hmm. think of a better time that we could have this? Like, wow. no, I, I can't. But then why did you say that my wine was good? He's like, because you brought it. Mm-hmm. You know, it's just like, and I'm, I'm a, not a good kid at 16. And it was a dagger into my rotten soul mm. to see the selflessness. And that was a different kind of leadership. Yeah. They and, saw the moment. It yeah. sounds like in both of those, like they met the moment, but they, also, they, they were able to see something different in that moment. That some people just don't see. Nope. That's significant. So, I mean, th- those are real easy, but I could list yeah. a oh, dozen yeah. from my dad. You yeah. know, like that guy is just. Wow. Yeah. And so that's seeing the selflessness and seeing, you know, the, the, um, the guy meet you and put his hand on your back and just meet that moment and yep. give you instructions. Like you were tapping into going, there's something there mm-hmm. in terms of leadership. Yeah. Yep. So when it comes to leadership, I mean, you know, one of the things I've said over the series is uh, what John Maxwell says, is leadership is influence, nothing more, nothing less. Yeah. So, you know, you've seen a ton of leadership. Would you add anything to that? Would you say like based on, you know, what I've seen in terms of leadership, what, I, what I've seen in terms of the greatest leaders in the world, like yeah. is that leadership or how would you define that? Uh, I, I agree with him, um, but I, I think there's so much missing because real leaders and real influencers, there's so much strategy and preparation that goes into it. Mm-hmm. Um, I was, we were looking for Zarqawi, which is at the time, Bin Laden was number one, Zarqawi was number two. Mm-hmm. He was the worst dude on the planet. He hung American from bridges. He posed with dead American bodies and holding their machine guns. He's a bad, bad guy. The mm-hmm. movie um, American Sniper where Chris Kyle's over there right. and he's trying to find the butcher or whatever that guy's name is. That guy worked for Zarqawi. Wow. And that, that guy's nothing compared to Zarqawi. And I'm sitting there on a knee, and General McChrystal comes um, uh, through my night vision. And he comes and puts, he says, hey, wh- what are you doing, soldier? I'm like, I'm pulling security. Who are you? He's like, this is General McChrystal. Wow. Whoa. This, this is pretty cool. You know, mm-hmm. what are you doing out here? He's like, whatever I want. I'm like, ah, yeah. <laughs> you, you can't do that, right? So yeah. Sergeant Kennedy here is going to continue to take a knee and pull security. Absolutely. But um, in that moment, he was influencing positively. Mm-hmm. He was checking, you know, t- checking task conditions, standards, making sure everybody's doing the right thing. But more important, like what got him there? Mm. There was a ton of discipline. There was a ton of preparation. Mm -hmm. And even Tom Way, as that paramedic coming, putting his hand on my shoulder, how many hours of training had he done? And how many, you know, years of experience had contributed to to him being able to lead to that moment? Mm -hmm. You know, we say that you're you're never going to rise to the occasion. You're only going to fall to your level of training. Hmm. And I think that is m- the most true when it comes to leadership. Right. You're never going to, Churchill did not be like, I'm rising to this moment. If you mm-hmm. look at Churchill's life, that man had m- dedicated his whole entire life up to that war. Mm. And then when that war happened, when they're like, how are we going to get these boys off this beach? Mm-hmm. And he stepped in there and he says, if we fail now, we're going to lose everything about mm. who we are and what we are and what we stand for mm. to ideas that we don't even understand. This was even before we knew about right. the genocide that was going to be um, forthcoming. And so in that quote about influence, you cannot truly be, you can't reach the 
potential of influence without discipline mm. and without strategy, without commitment. Mm -hmm. And um, to be ready for that moment, you're not going to rise to that moment. You're going to fall to the mm -hmm. level of preparation. Right. It's all those little things you've done mm -hmm. behind the scenes for, you know, months, weeks, years yeah. to prepare you for that big moment. 100%. Yeah, for him to put his hand on your back. Yeah. And to recognize that's what he needs to do. Yeah. And to recognize to give you instructions. And then save that little girl's life. Yeah. You know, and yeah. probably saved my mind. Right. Wow. Yeah. I love that. Yeah. Well, so, I mean, I would imagine you've been around some of the greatest leaders of all time. Some pretty cool ones. Yeah. yeah. And, you know, sat in rooms and you're like, my goodness, like this guy. And, you know, you just, it, it, being around it, being in those environments, I would imagine like a lot of that's ru rubbed off on you. And over the years, you've probably picked up maybe one or two or three things that you would just say, man, these are, these are some of the greatest leadership principles that I just carry with me. Yep. And so, I mean, we're talking about leadership. How do we grow in our influence? Because we want to experience strength. We want to experience endurance. And I'm curious, just on the other side of you, like, what are those like one, two, three leadership lessons that you would just go, I think these are transferable for everybody. Yeah. I think men, women, children, families, couples, the whole thing. These are great leadership principles you live your life by. The word strength and endurance. Um, when, when you look at the human condition, like mm -hmm. we, we are, we are a very unique species mm -hmm. and we can never when it, especially when it comes to leadership, like if, if you are a poorly functioning human, right, you're not healthy, mm -hmm. um, overweight, um, not eating clean, uh, drinking, smoking, not getting good sleep. Mm -hmm. At what point do you think that you're going to be able to come out and be a leader, mm. right? Like your brain is not yeah. going to function under stress. You start piling on all these external stressors. Mm -hmm. well, I mean, even just occupationally, uh, just work or as a father, your sure. kids are coming home from school. One of them's whining. One of them's teething. Mm -hmm. Then the, the six year olds, like I, I need help with, I don't, you know, with my arithmetic and you're like, yes. you're, you're six. You don't know how to do math yet. You know, and you're like, Oh, missed that moment. Yeah. You know, like, you can't perform. Mm. So when you look at the Petraeuses and the McChrystals and the Mattises mm -hmm. and you know, some of the, the, the best military leaders, and then you look to the civilian leaders, while well, some of them ho horribly flawed, um, from Martin Luther King mm -hmm. to, I mean, e even now like the Dan Crenshaws and the Casso Cortezes, mm -hmm. opposite ends of the aisle, but sure. all of them have a very similar approach. Like right. they can work. They can do a volume of work that would be very challenging for a not healthy person to keep up with. Mm -hmm. Like I argue that Dan Crenshaw and Ocasio Cortez could go out there and they could, could campaign twenty four hours a day for days on end. You're right. like, how can they do that? Well, they're they're in, they're they're incredibly accomplished people that are very high functioning, mm. but you can't high function when you're broken. Mm -hmm. So you kind of got to. So one one of the big takeaways when you look at these leaders is like, man, they're. They, as a human, are mm. a high-functioning human. They have to do that first before they can. you can look at, like, the positional yeah. authority and moral authority. Like, mm -hmm. they have to be able to function. Yeah. It's kind of the basics. Yeah. It's you, You've got to make sure those are intact and you're disciplined around the smaller things, if you will, yeah. to be prepared for those bigger moments. Yeah. yeah. I love that. Yeah. Anything else you would add in terms of just, you know— Leadership principles or, man, this is so helpful in terms of, because I think we're all looking for it. Moms are looking for it. Dads are looking for it. You yeah. know, we're all going, gosh, we want to grow. Yeah, I don't know mm -hmm. um, is the best things that can come out of a leader's mouth. Mm. I, th I think if you're in the position of authority or you think you have moral authority, like I have all the answers, mm -hmm. you don't. Mm -hmm. And there's nothing wrong with being able to be like, I don't know. Right. Um, but I'm going to be with you and we're going to figure this out. Yeah. Um, what is the best solution for this problem? <sighs> I don't know. Mm -hmm. What do you think? Yeah. You know, um, I'm, I'm looking at it from this perspective. You're looking at it from this perspective. Um, what are your thoughts on this? Mm. Like solution comes to fruition, but right. it's like, do you want, let's go this route. Yeah. Do you just, just come up with that out of your out of your butt. Yeah, like, that's, totally. that's not helpful. Yeah, and so much of that's like the the pride angle. You know, it requires humility, yeah. especially as you rise through the ranks and you gain more authority and you gain more influence, more positions. You feel this weird like expectation to some degree to go. I have to know. I yeah. have to know. And then the reality to go like, hey, one of the you know greatest positions of strength right now is to go. I don't know. Yeah. I mean, that requires a certain amount of humility yeah. to be able to say that. But the best ideas are going to come to the table. 
Yeah. Anybody that says, I'm in charge here, they're not in charge. Yeah, that's the moment you know they're not. You know, you're like, that guy doesn't know <laughs> yeah. what's going on here. It's like a parent going, I'm your father. Yeah. You will listen to me. And I'm like, uh, no. yeah, at that point, I think you've lost a little influence. Yeah. You know, but I, I think there are times you should do that, <laughs> especially uh, when they're younger. <laughs> <laughs> I don't know. My, my kids, um, much to my wife's chagrin, um, I, I challenge them anytime that I don't want to. I never want to tell them what to do. And if they don't want to do something, I don't want them to do it just because I say so. Mm -hmm. So even my five-year-old, um, you know, he's like, I don't want to do that. I'm like, that's, that's meaningless to me. Mm -hmm. Is there a reason? Mm -hmm. And then he'll be like, well, what if we started doing this this way? I'm mm -hmm. like, huh, hmm. that sounds awesome. Mm -hmm. Let's yeah. do that. Mm -hmm. uh, going outside, you know, if he's going to earn an allowance, he has to work for X amount, amount of time in a day. Mm -hmm. And, um, and, you know, I was having him go and change out the um, pool filters and just get all the leaves out of it. Mm -hmm. Easiest task, right? But there was a couple of dead frogs in there. And he didn't want to, I didn't realize he didn't want to do it because there, there's like dead frogs in there. Sure. Yeah. And he's like, I don't want to do that. And I was like, ah, well, it doesn't really matter what you want. Mm -hmm. You know, um, that's what I asked you to do. And I'm like, but do you have something else that you'd rather do? And he's like, well, can I go get sticks? Mm. Like, you want to go pick up? sticks in the front yard absolutely you know mm. fantastic why don't you want to do this other thing and he's like oh because there's you know there's some dead frogs in there and i was mm -hmm. like great talk <laughs> sticks it is you yeah. know like yeah for sure well i love that because there's a there's there's a sense of two things that are happening there's a curiosity on your side to go like hey is there another approach is there another angle than just simply pragmatically saying do this yeah. and then there's your, your you know i love the the i don't know if the right words like intentionality but it's a thought beyond the thought it's like, let's get beyond just this pragmatic notion that we're like right here and I'm going to tell you exactly what to do, but can we get to the why? Can we get to something deeper? Can we get to yeah. a little bit more? I want to explore you. I want to discover you. I want to see how God made you. And I think that's a really cool thing. With this generation, um, I'm not throwing stones at millennials uh, or Gen Zs, but they communicate and need the reason why. Mm -hmm. If I tell one, like in my era, when I was going through special force selection, you, you would have to murder me in my sleep for me not to go do something you told me to do. If you're mm -hmm. like, go do this thing, that thing's going to happen unless you killed me in my sleep. Mm. Now you have to tell them the reason why. And that's an awesome thing. And that's a beautiful thing. Mm -hmm. But as a leader, it, that was a really hard yeah. thing for me to get around. I'm like, yeah. what do you mean I have to tell you why? Right. Like I'm a special forces boss here and yeah. you're going to like, go do what I tell, told you to yeah, do. Yeah, like right now. Or... <sighs> okay, the reason why is yeah. because um, if we do this subsequently, this thing's going to happen, which enables us to go and do this really cool thing. Mm -hmm. You want to go do that cool thing? Well, yeah. that's impossible unless we do this. Mm. You want to go to the range and 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 do this awesome full mission profile? We're going to fast rope in on the helicopter. Well, I ask you to do an ammo forecast so I could request for ammo. But if you don't do that, then we won't have the ammo to do this mission. Mm. If we don't do that mission, we're not mission capable to deploy and go and do this really cool thing. Yeah. Yeah. And again, it feels like the basic things that you were alluding to earlier, if you're not taking care of the basic things, you do not have the patience to meet the moment. Like yeah. the leaders in your life met the moment to be able to explain the why to yep. get the outcome you want. And I think all of that, the intentionality around, you know, thinking through all those aspects of leadership, because ultimately you're trying to, you know, gain more influence, influence people to do, you know, something of a common cause or what have you. Yeah. And it requires just meeting that moment, but you have to be in condition to be able to meet those moments. Yep. Um, um, David walking out to kill Goliath. Um, I think there's a chapter missing. Mm. And that was how many times David had flung a stone. Mm -hmm. um, could you guess? Oh, pastor? I, it's probably hundreds of times. Yeah. yeah. I would have guessed. Yeah. I mean, because, because there was a confidence there to go like, are you kidding me? Yeah. And was, he walked was, out. Was God there? Absolutely. Sure. Did yeah. he kill this massive mountain of a man? Mm -hmm. Absolutely. Mm -hmm. You know, but like, let's not take away the preparation mm -hmm. that went into right. who he was in that moment. Mm -hmm. Yeah. No, it's uh, so hearing you say that, um, one of the things we talked about in this series is, is there's like, um, there's something that motivates us to do the work. There's something that motivates us to d be disciplined. And uh, in part one, we talked about the why. And so as I sit here on the other side of you, hearing your stories, which are just unbelievable stories, and 
you know, it's clear that you're disciplined. It's clear that you're intentional. It's clear that you're paying attention. But it feels like there's there's a deep why behind all of that that is is driving you. And, you know, morning after morning, day after day, you have this tenacity and this resolve to kind of go like, okay, there's a there's there's got to be a deep why. So I'm just curious. I don't know if you're open to it, but, yeah. like, what's the deep why behind Tim Kennedy? Um, failure. Mm. You know, a lot of failure. Going back to firefighting, there's a, a young fighter, fi- firefighter behind me named Alan Lanier. And we were in a fire in a music studio and they had put like crates up against the wall and mattresses um, to try just to help insulate from sound so they didn't bother their neighbors. Um, Unbeknownst to us, that was creating an oven and there was, the fire was rolling over and there was so much smoke from all the music equipment that was black and you couldn't see anything. We're on the ground and I'm on the nozzle, so I'm in the front and above us, it was rolling over. So the, the fire, like in backdraft, you know, you have the fires mm-hmm. happening on the ceiling. We just can't see it because it's so dark. And we started seeing these like little fireflies around us. And that was the room beginning to combust. And then it combusted. And the whole time, Alan was like trying to pull me back. You know, being like, hey, something's off. Mm-hmm. Something's off. And I'm on the nozzle. I'm like, I'm on the nozzle. You know, like, yeah, I'm on the nozzle. <laughs> and then whoosh, the room lights up. Wow. Like the... Uh, the self-contained breathing apparatus, you know, it's like plastic glass, plastic glass, the plastic melted, glass shattered, plastic melted. And when we got out there, you know, Alan, so I opened the nozzle and um, I burnt Alan real bad from the steam and the vapor that dripped off us onto him. My helmet was totally, looked like a, um, like pop rocks. What are those mm-hmm. things you put in there? It goes like, yeah, 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 pop rocks. Yeah, that's what it sounded as my helmet was melting. Yeah, yeah. So th- thank God we get out there. We don't die. Mm. Um, and there's a moment of failure there. There's there there was a leadership moment where I wasn't listening because mm. I was in charge. Mm-hmm. Right, I'm on the nozzle. You know, go to 2010. Um, so we'd been in the war for eight years, and I would write down names of my teammates that had died mm-hmm. and. Um, whether it was on Memorial Day or Veterans Day or whatever funeral I had to go to this week. And they were every week. Mm. And um, there's a point where I was like, I couldn't remember their names. There, mm-hmm. there's, there's too many of them. And then one of my teammates, Sean McClure, um, who, who's now dead, but he got in a really sketchy situation that I probably should have been there with him, but then... I was showboating and I was trying to go to these cool schools and I was getting ready to go to another selection. And mm. I thought I was, you know, too cool for school, um, fighting in, in, you know, mixed martial arts. Um, and, uh, I took all of those deaths and failures as my failures. Mm. And, you know, I took what is now clearly survivor's guilt and I weaponized that. Mm. I, I took that and I said, okay, I'm going to be first. I'm going to be, I'm going to be the most trained. I'm going to be the most physically capable. I'll strategically have the best understanding of what's happening, Mm -hmm. you know, whether it's globally or regionally or, um, all the way down to our immediate near, Mm -hmm. I'm going to understand every echelon of these issues. Um, and so I, I try to, the why is I weaponized these failures Hmm. and, um, you know, never again will that failure be on my lack of preparedness. Mm-hmm. And that drives you. It's one of many things. Yeah. yeah. Fear yeah. of failure. Yeah. Yeah. It's those pivotal moments, those pivotal circumstances, you know, you know, as uh, growing up in a home, you know, perhaps your father did something or your mo- mother did something. You're like, never again, no. never again. And, and it, it, it solidifies your why which gives you a heck of a lot of motivation yeah. to do the things you do. And you're doing a lot. Yeah. So, you know, that's, that's a lot of motivation. Yeah. Standing in the middle of an octagon in front of millions of people <laughs> and watching the guy next to you have his hand raised yeah. as you're looking at blood drip off your nose. Right. You know, that's, I've never experienced it. It's, but failure, failure's yeah. failure. Sure. Yeah. I have just had extraordinary failure. Yeah. You know, yeah. The <laughs> which good, bad. Yeah. 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 I mean, my closest is like a golf match. Yeah. So in high school, you know, yeah. well, I mean, losing sucks. Oh yeah. Yeah. And it's a driver. Yeah. You know, a little bit of that was for my dad. You know, my dad was, was that a double entendre right there. What's that? It's a driver. Is we're talking about golf? Yeah. A little bit. You you're know. clever. Yeah. You're, you're no, 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 no. Pastors no. are so tricky with words. Well, 
hopefully we're not that tricky. We try to, <laughs> hopefully we're like somewhat straightforward. You know, a little bit clearer is, is a little bit better. But I mean, all those things, I mean, I, I, there's, there's motivations. I think about my, you know, my dad for so long, it was performance based, like yeah. dad, am I enough? Dad, am I enough? And, you know, that was my why for a while. But they, I think everybody's got a why. But I think, you know, in part one, I was talking about how important it is to find your why and to have clarity around that because we've got to have motivators. There's yeah. so many things. There's uncertainties. There's the ups and downs of life. And it's like, can you find your motivators? You know, in your marriage, can you find your motivators with your kids? Can you find your motivators for personal health? Yeah. You've got to find those things. And that's important to be able to identify those. Yeah. I think uh, when people have failure, they, they try to dilute it. You know, they, they try to soften it, medicate it. Mm. They forget about it. They don't um, acknowledge it. Um, they drink it away. They mm -hmm. smoke it away. In insert every unhealthy mechanism right. to try to, to soften the pain of failure. Mm -hmm. um, and while I, I, I wish that my kids never had to, to suffer the same kind of failures that I've suffered, I also know that they're the best learning tools. Mm. And... Um, in a society where we're always looking for easy solutions and quick fixes and pills that take away pain, um, I, I argue that we have to understand and not relish, mm -hmm. not not sit there in this depressed moment of our failure, but and we're not rushing to failure because I never want to fail. But when I do fail, I absolutely want to understand everything about that failure so right. I can try and prevent it from ever happening again. Mm. Not dilute it, not... Um, soften it, mm -hmm. not lick, you know, medicate it. Right. Um, learn from it. Learn from it. Yeah. Yeah. That's interesting. I wonder, you know, sometimes th there's a book uh, that we read together as a staff called leadership pain. And it's like, you know, as you walk towards the messes and as you walk towards these failures or you experience these failures, like it's one of the greatest teaching lessons in life. Mm -hmm. And it, it, uh, it, perhaps puts a lens, not a, not a holistic lens, but it perhaps puts a lens on some of the things that God allows, yeah. you know, because if we're, if we can recognize it in our finite beings to be able to go, Hey, some of the greatest moments of leadership, some of the greatest teachable moments, some of the greatest growth moments have happened in some really hard circumstances. Yeah. You know, sometimes the question could be to God, God, do you love us enough to allow us to fail? Because if you do love us enough to allow us to fail, maybe, you know, the church word, sanctification, the growth aspect, yeah. perhaps that's one of the, the most loving things he could do to a degree yeah. to allow us to grow. Yep. Yeah, but then us and you know, me, to include myself, mm -hmm. um, the, the moments of my, my largest, biggest questions about faith are in these darkest moments mm -hmm. where I'm like, seriously, you're not here for this, mm -hmm. you know, in, in this pain, in the suffering, where are you right now? Mm -hmm. um, you know, then now... 25 years later, I was like, well, that shaped where I am today. So much. Yeah. Um, have I, for, you know, like, I, let's super be clear. I would love a Job moment where I get to like fight or wrestle God and, and figure out some of these, right. these questions that I have. But mm. now you get, get to look back and be like, oh man, was he right? Mm -hmm. Was this part of his big plan? Yeah. I almost don't care. I'm still mad at him. Yeah. Like, let's figure out this stuff from 50, you know, but like, yeah, God is a mysterious God. He is. And, you know, when you think about that and then you take, you know, Christ on the cross, which is one of the most horrific moments, yeah. one of the most painful moments, but you, you see like what, what's happening in that moment. That's one of God's greatest expressions of love for you and for me yeah. in one of the hardest possible moments. And at the time, that's all they could see. But, you know, time is the you know, gives you perspective. Yep. Unfortunately, we just have a finite amount of time. Yeah. I'm glad I'm not Jesus. <laughs> yeah. They're like, all right, so we're yeah. going to go ahead and crucify him. Like, nice. I'm going to go ahead and bring in this legion of, of dudes with flaming swords and we're going to chop all you down. This is going to be awesome. Yeah. All right, here we yeah. go. See, Fight you'd be on. Peter back then. You'd be like, here's my sword, baby. Yeah. I also, how do you only do, get that dude's ear? I don't know. You know, like there's not, I don't know I think he, God was like, oh, well, him. he could have been such him. a novice. I mean, he could have been, you know, if I had a sword, I'd be like flailing it all around. Maybe he was like that. Maybe. I don't know. He was a fisherman, so yeah. not a swordsman. <laughs> yeah, clearly. <laughs> Anyways, hey, so um, as we wrap up, and I really appreciate the time, I, I want to do something, and uh, I just want to get your blink thoughts. So okay. Mal Malcolm Gladwell has that book, you know, just blink, like the immediate thought that hits you. Okay. 
And so in terms of leadership mm. and, you know, just for folks that are listening in, I think there's a lot of areas that we would just go, man, what does leadership look like here? Mm. And there's a question that I ask myself and that I've heard several times is, you know, what would a great leader do? Like just pause long enough, you know, just breathe for a second and just ask that question and think about the answer. What would a great leader do? Yeah. And so I'm sitting on the other side of a great leader and I'm curious how you would answer these in a bleak fashion. So if I said, what would a great leader do when things seem uncertain? What would you say? Yeah. Having confidence that everything that you want is on the far side of hard work. Yeah. You know, especially now mm. where people are looking for quick solutions. Sometimes you just have to do the work. You have to pour your soul and your passion and your blood and your sweat and your calloused chunks and your sleepless nights. You have to pour it into it. Mm -hmm. And when it comes to leadership, um, that's even more paramount where people are looking to you. You have to be the first one there and the last one to leave. Mm -hmm. You have to be the highest functioning person. You're not walking in there, you know, with bags underneath your eyes because you're sitting there playing video games too late and you stink of smoke. And maybe you're out this weekend having a couple of drinks with your friends at the scar party at the, par at the poker night. And then you come in and you think you're going to lead on Monday. Mm -hmm. No, Mm -hmm. No, you have to lead. Yeah. And that's on the far side of hard work. Mm. It's good. Yeah. Okay. So blink thought here. What would a great leader do when they are losing the trust of their kids? They're watching their kids kind of drift. Yeah. Uh, connection is an influence is, is millions of little decisions, mm -hmm. right? When the, the Titanic is cruising towards that iceberg, had they turned it just one degree mm -hmm. at the helm, an hour ago, it would have easily missed that thing. One degree, just mm -hmm. that little bit, right? Mm -hmm. So you're losing. All it takes is the first decision in the right direction. Mm -hmm. And then the next time, two decisions. Mm -hmm. So a 1% improvement at the right time could save you from mm. disaster and everybody's freezing to death and drowning right. in the ocean, right? I'm uh, uh, using a metaphor here, but sure. it's that 1% improvement mm -hmm. and knowing that I just have to start with the first problem in front of me and address it and try and fix it. General Mattis said, um, when asked, what's the most important thing that he does in a day? He said, make my bed. Because hmm. he would start the day with doing something the right way first, mm -hmm. and then everything else would build on that. Mm. So you're losing touch, you're losing influence, you're failing, you're getting further apart. All you have to start doing is making the right decisions. Mm -hmm. Yeah, I love that. It's the small things. Yeah. And you can do that. Yeah. Like that's something every single father, every single mother can do if yeah. they're watching their kids drift go, okay, I, I can start today. And make that decision today. You think the Disneyland dad solution is going to fix it? No, it will make it worse. Mm -hmm. You know, like the, the interpersonal development of, okay, whew, mm -hmm. what is that first problem? Yeah. And how do I fix it? Yeah, that's great. Okay, how about this one? These are good questions. Well, <laughs> yeah, well I, I mean, drink here. obviously, I mean, you know, there's a lot of context to this, but I love your blink answers. So uh, how about this? Um, you know, a lot of people are facing some financial you know, tension right now. Yeah. So if you, uh, to answer the question, what would a great leader do when they are in trouble financially? <laughs> Button the hatches. Mm -hmm. The, um, taking that step and looking at your life, man, I have so many things that I don't need. Mm -hmm. I love, you know, being able to like have a good cup of coffee and, and tacos and go down to Veracruz, you know, and, and drive a cool truck. Do I need any of that? Mm -hmm. I don't, I don't need anything. Right. What, what would we need to, to see some of the most beautiful scriptures be written? We needed to sell mm -hmm. with nothing, mm -hmm. right? And, mm -hmm. and so taking that and looking at what are the things that I don't need that I can happily sacrifice to better position myself economically mm -hmm. to start turning this corner or even just to survive. Sometimes it's just to survive and that, that is fine. And there's no shame in asking for help. Mm -hmm. Um, you never want to ask, I don't know what, what the, what the problem is with people where it's like, man, I'm having a tough time. Can, there's nothing wrong with asking for help. Mm. But if you're asking for, for help when you're still going and getting tacos and coffee and driving a cool truck with a high interest rate, mm -hmm. um, you gotta, you gotta fix your ship. Mm -hmm. You gotta button the hatches yeah. and then you be in a position to, to go out and, and ask. Yeah. And, um, you know, asking God first and mm -hmm. then God will hopefully, yeah, bring some people in your life. Mm -hmm. And then be willing to ask, hey, can yeah. you help? Can we have a conversation? Yeah. yeah, just having another set of eyes, like a fresh set of eyes on stuff. Yeah. So helpful. Okay, last one. Okay. You ready for this yeah, one? Yeah, these, these, these are three tough ones in a row. I don't know what number four is going to be. 
Okay, so this is uh, in terms of relationships, marriage, dating relationships. Yeah, all you that don't want to answer I me mean, my answers on this one. But, but no, okay. I bet Fire you'll have some though. good insight Let's here. See. I mean, okay, so what would a great leader do when their marriage is stale? So they're just going like there's apathy setting in. Ah, yeah. uh, just you know, she's not doing it for me any longer. He's not doing it for me any longer. You know, I'm not sure. All of that's just sinking in. Yeah, you're a piece of crap. That's what's <laughs> happening. Um, so. If the grass is greener on the other side, it's because you're not cultivating and treating the grass on this side of your fence, mm. right? And and like, it's clear how we go, grow good grass, right? We have great nutrients, right? The soil is fresh. There's plenty of water. There's plenty, plenty of sun. Like, that sounds like a pretty, like if I was a cow, that's the side of the fence I would want to be on because like things are pretty rad. Right. So if you're sitting there like, man, things are just, this sucks. Um, look at yourself. Like, what are you doing? What are you sacrificing? What are you contributing? What are you encouraging? Um you know, if she's unhappy, it's probably because you're being a jerk. You know, mm-hmm. if um, the grass is greener over there, you need to start treating the grass on this side of the fence to, to see any change. Mm. Um, I love contrast. I, I've been fortunate because I get to go away and, and live in Niger or Burkina Faso or Mortania. Mm. And, and like I'm living off these brown crappy things and living in dirt and sand and, um, you know, like pooping in a hole and I come home and I get to smell my wife, Mm. you know, and I get to see my kids, you know, and there's this ravenous, like, ah, Mm. awesome contrast. Mm -hmm. I don't want lukewarm anything, Mm -hmm. right? I don't want Cheerios that have been sitting there in soggy milk. I don't want my coffee to be 90 degrees. I want it to be 190 degrees. I don't want my champagne Mm -hmm. to be 90 degrees. I want my champagne to be 34 degrees. Mm -hmm. And to do that in a relationship it means that you have to appreciate the full spectrum, mm. specifically of your partner. And so if your hands aren't calloused and sore, if you don't go to bed with your back just aching from the amount of work that you did in a day, and I'm using the back as, as a metaphor for like what you contributed sure. to your kids and to yeah. your wife, you know, when, and then she walks into the room and you're like, never mind, I'm no longer tired. <laughs> the problem is not her. The problem is you. Yeah. Yeah. Fix it. Yeah. That's so good. The intentionality behind all of that, you know, I I think is so critical. And I love what you're saying. It's like, man, just, you know, on Sunday I talked about this a little bit where I said, you know, quit playing the blame game. You know, quit keeping like a, 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 um, you know, ledger. Here's what she does. Here's what I do. Like just be intentional. You know, own your piece of the pie. You know, work your, your, your side of the fence. And I think that intentionality is exactly what Christ called us to do. He says, man, I didn't come to be served. I came to serve and to give my life as a ransom for many. Like husbands, go do that. Yeah. And I love that. So, well, man, thank you. This Pleasure. Is, yeah, this is great. This is a lot of fun for me. Yeah. Do I get to come back to church? I don't know. Okay. I don't know. All yeah, right. We'll put monitors at the door, but you'll bust through that. Right. I'm, I'm sure of it. <laughs> okay. Yeah. Anyways, I really do appreciate it. This is a big chunk of time and a, a commitment to that. So... Love your perspective on leadership. And then, uh, hey, next week, we're going to wrap up the series. Yeah, and, why'd you um, choose bricks? Uh, we were thinking rocks. Well, we were thinking about the wall of Nehemiah. Oh, yeah. And so yeah. we were like rocks, but it. then we were like, ah, rocks. But then bricks is a little bit more, you know, contextualized to today because, mm-hmm. you know, so yeah. we went back and forth and then the graphics and then some of the things behind the scenes to create the key art. Yeah, they're cool. Yeah. <laughs> So bricks. Yeah. Found foundational. Yeah. I like it. There you go. Hey, thanks, my friend. My pleasure. All right. 